money. money. The game everyone plays, but few win. Extracting the knowledge from the top 1%. Extracting the knowledge. And teaching you the ever-changing rules of play. It's time to level up and take control of the money game. Let's talk money. Big, big, big money. Yes! Welcome back to the money game. I've got a, a special guest on, a guy that I'm super stoked to pick his brain. I, I love getting to have people on. Jason, like yourself, how are you doing, man? I'm doing so good, man. Thank you so much for having me on. I complete honor. Dude, we're grateful that you could carve some time out. I know it's a busy time in the family and being married, so uh, we're, we're grateful for it. But, uh, for sure. For any of you guys who, who don't know Jason, you're not following on anything, this dude's a stud. Uh, you're 28, 29? Uh, 29, 29. So just two years older than me. Yep. And that's something I love to, to chop with people kind of in a similar, you know, probably grew up in the same, we were told the same things in high school and probably some of the same things. We start going to college and seeing people who break in the mold and doing things a little different. Cause I think there's some, right. there's some connections. There's some correlations of, of why you are the way you are. And I, we're definitely going to chop into that. But for you guys who don't know, for this sure. dude has built a, an RV empire built it up by the time yep. you're 28 like 100 million dollars of rv dealerships and everything combined yep 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 um yeah our dealerships i guess in 2021 did 100 103 million so um last year we did 111 million so we grew a little bit but in a down market i was happy about that so yeah yeah i mean we're we got a lot of things going dude which is crazy and i think sometimes especially in today the that there's all this stuff i see all the time and I'm talking about wealth and building stuff and there's trust the process and grow and do this. And, but like, dude, you're, you're really freaking young. I mean, you're, you're 29. Yeah. You, you built something that's yeah. by no means small. Like dude, you're getting triple digit millions. Like dude, it's, it's a big deal. Um, it's pretty right. freaking sick, but no, thank you. I know as I've, I've looked in some of your stuff, dude, you, you said something really funny on one of the podcasts that you did that, uh, as a kid, you're like, dude, uh, I probably had every three letter acronym, to my name growing up that I, you know, broken, yep. I, I consider myself broken. So it's like, dude, from childhood to 27, most people, when I think 25 to 28, it's like still kid. At least I still feel very childlike with some of the partners and deals I'm doing. Right. Walk me through, dude, what, what makes or starts that transition? And obviously that's 15, 20 years, right? But dude, that is a condensed time to pull off what you're doing. What are some of the limiting beliefs, some of the things that expose you to be able to start building this person that you've become to do the things that you're doing? Man, I got so lucky because I have such, I have the most amazing parents in the world and I have a very unique childhood. If you know anything about my story, I mean, I grew up in extreme wealth, extreme, extreme wealth. Um, you know, my mom and dad had jets. We had Rolls Royces and freaking nice house and all this stuff. But what mom and dad taught us was our money's our money. Your money's your money. You're not rich. We're rich. So you have nothing to do with our money. You know, they're the type of people that we, they would fly on their private jet. We would, you know, if we were going to California, we would fly commercial to California. We didn't earn a, a seat on the plane. No just way. Because so our they'd last put name you guys on a separate plane and they'd go fly in the jet. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. All awesome. the um, you know, but they also, but the, but the thing that they did give us is belief and a vision and um, you know, keep telling us that you can do anything you want to be, you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. And they never made us be, do anything or be anything. They never forced us into a different industry. They never forced us what they did onto us They never forced us to do anything. And so I think what at an early age, but the lucky thing that I had is I had parents telling me that I could do anything and I could be anything and to have a vision and to have a dream. I, I remember being a little a really little kid having those dreams and having those visions and and wanting to be more and be better and just be this this figure and this you know to help people and to really you know be you know who I am today and you know it came from when I was a little kid and I watched my mom and dad help a ton of people yeah I mean they made a lot of money but they helped so many people they're known for more more lives they've changed and people they've helped than anybody cares about anything they had and that was in a, you know, that was a long time ago. They, you know, they sold everything when I kind of got old enough. Um, you know, they sold their plan. They sold all that, you know, that kind of nice stuff. Cause my dad's not a materialistic guy by any means. He's a avid Walmart shopper for his clothes. And like, well, you know, he makes fun of me cause I have an insane shoe collection. And he's like, dude, I buy one pair of shoes a year, maybe. And I'm like, well, we're a little different that way. 
but I, I had this vision and this dream of who I wanted to be and how I wanted to operate, you know, at a very young age. And when I got into high school, it really was just a decision I made. Um, I was a little bit of an, I was a very high, what if you, you know, anything about my, I coach on personality as I was a high yeah. I, if you want to use the disc personality, it was a high I, but I, but oddly enough, I was a little bit introverted and I just, I wanted to do my own thing and I could be by myself and I was perfectly happy and fine with that. And at a very early age, I, I wanted to be like my dad. And yeah. so I watched my dad read books. So I would read books. I watched my dad go to these conferences. So I would be like, Hey dad, can I go to conference? Um, he he owned some very large companies and sat on boards of some companies that were you know multi billion dollar companies, and so I got that opportunity to be able to go you know sit in those conference rooms and sit in those boardrooms and learn all I could, and and that I I did it all through high school. Like I studied and studied and studied. I wasn't going and partying. Um, I just studied everything I could about business and about life and about relationships and about how people do what they do or why people do what they do and like everything more which was outside, you know, a, a 15, 16, 17, 18 year old should not really like, like looking back, I got, I don't know if it was a good thing or bad thing. Cause it definitely set me up, but I didn't get to experience a lot of what maybe I should have. Yeah. Um, but I was like, Hey, y'all are partying after the football game for what? Like, like I'm going to go party on my yacht in 10, 15 years. Like, yep. you know, I'm going to go create something while you guys like, you know, do your thing. Like I, I had a good time and was a friendly dude and all that, but like, I was so laser focused on what I wanted and what I wanted to do. And you know, my, I have a twin brother and he's the complete opposite of me. I have an older brother. It's complete opposite. And I have an older sister that's sim similar. Yeah. Um, but I just, it was a decision I made to just what I wanted my life to look like. And I wasn't going to let anybody tell me no, or, or tell me that I couldn't do it. Yeah. I, I so think it's, it's interesting you said that. Cause I, I've had, you know, a lot of people on and kind of some people come from nothing, come from something. I definitely not from the type of wealth you're talking, but came from a pretty, you know, lucrative family, you know, the planes and different things. And I think it, the, the one commonality that I feel everybody has as they're coming up is either they had to provide for themselves or parents kind of made that a, a prerequisite. Like, Hey, this is ours. You got to figure out what you want to do. But for you, right, you have siblings that are different. Do you feel kind of, it, it, I feel this way that seeing kind of similar to you, I idolized what my dad did and the business that he did and, and kind of the way he operated and the way he learned and the way he took on challenges, but nothing was like ever given. Do you feel like seeing that just opened the paradigm of, hey, not that anything could like, it's just given to you, but then you understand, hey, like th this is up to me to go make things happen. 100%. I mean, I, I watched my mom and dad hustle. I mean, they were on the road 300 days a year for 25 years. Wow. And I mean, my entire, I mean, it was more odd for them to be home than it was for them to be away. Now, is there challenges with that? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I'm not going to say I'm a perfect dude and I, I have some struggle with, with some issues and that's another subject. But what it did is I watched my mom and dad hustle. I watched them go get what they wanted. I watched them go help people. I watched them go make money. And so as a kid, I just was like, hey, like, it's just expected. I have to go hustle. Yeah. I have to go do what I have to do to get my dreams. I need to go help people. I need to go make it happen. And so they, they were the example for me. And, and, I, and the good thing about that is they, they showed me that it was possible. Yeah. I was having this conversation with a gentleman last night and he was like, I am showing by example to my kids that they need to go out there and hustle and work to make their life happen. How, whatever that means, whatever that's in sports and academics and college, like whatever that means, you have to go make it happen. And I had the opportunity to watch my mom and dad do that. And this gentleman that I was talking to last night, he's done it for his kids. I mean, he's, you know, done very well in, in his life in, in, in real estate specifically. And so I think that's important, especially like, you know, there's a, we're our society, I, you know, with, with kids and we're having kids, like I have a daughter. Um, I think it's really important for me to go show her that you have to go out and hustle. You have to go put in the work. You have to go, you know, practice. Like if she wants to be in soccer or dance mm -hmm. or whatever, like, she's in dance and tumbling right now. And luckily my wife, um, you know, has been a, a professional dancer. That sounds like she's a stripper, but she, you know, <laughs> danced for like uh, NFL teams and NBA teams and Very did cool. that whole thing yeah. for, you know, for a long time. So she actually practices with her and, and my daughter is super excelling. Like she's only four and she's in the six and seven year old classes and they even beyond because she can, I mean, we almost got her flipping. We almost got her doing all kinds of crazy stuff because she's practicing, right? Yeah. And like, we're showing her that you have to put in the work and practice to be able to do that. 
And then she's seeing dad and even her mom, like we're hustling, trying to make that happen. So I think that's important. That starts at an early age because we don't know it, but the kids see this. They see, Sponges. oh, you know, mom and dad's lazy. So I guess I'm just not going to do anything. And I'm not going to pigeonhole anybody and saying like, if you have parents that aren't successful or on a certain way, then you can't be. But it makes it, it all comes back to a decision that you have to make to, to design your life however you want it to look like. No, I, I like that a lot because I, I often – I think, especially as you go bigger and you start to think about the time you have with your family, and obviously I know you have a young daughter and, you know, you guys are young too, and we're having another daughter. I know you, you guys are having another child as well. And so it's like right. allocating those things. And it's it, the more and more I get into it, just to reiterate, I completely agree with you. Like, I don't ever want to be in a position where my kids don't they don't comprehend what it takes to get what they have or to hit certain levels of athletic achievement or financial achievement. Like you, you got to pay your dues no matter which way you go. You want to be a certain level athlete? Like you got to watch film. You got to do all the stuff that you got to do. You want to be a certain level businessman? You got to study. You got to be deliberate. You got to be executing and you have to be a little gritty. Right. There, there's just no free rides. Right. Right. No, hundred percent. And, and you know, it, it's hard because I'm, I'm in this constant battle of like, that I want to be hard. like my mom and dad were hard, maybe to a little too extreme. Um, <laughs> but I'm in this constant battle. It's like I don't want my daughter to be entitled and I don't want her to feel like things yeah. are normal. But at the same time, like I've hustled and done things in my life to want to provide a, a certain life for her. So it's like it's this fine line. But I think that it all comes down to the values and what you what you value as a family and what you value to show her yeah. or, you know, for me to show show my daughter. And then it comes back to, you know, things with with that hustle of like, OK, what are the non-negotiables in your life and what, what do I want to be at? And it's like, okay, Hey, you know, I might miss a soccer game or might miss this or might miss that. And then it's like, Oh, Hey, I went to a soccer game. I don't want to miss that. I'm going to work later or more in a certain days where I can. And it's knowing that it's having that communication and having, you know, one of the spouses supports you, but then, you know, it's kids that, that see that hustle and see that grind. Um, I think is really, you know, in my eyes, good for them. Now there's extremes, to everything. I yeah. mean, like yeah, I, I crack a joke that my mom and dad had us and then 18 years later they came back and there's you know some <laughs> truth to that but um obviously there's an extreme to to any of that but it's it's important for them to see that and to yeah. and for you to to keep you know if that's a driving factor to you to keep to, to feel like you know because as a parent you can almost feel like you, it's you feel bad right it's like oh hey i'm missing this and i'm a bad parent and i'm this and i'm that and it's like no no no. you have to keep your dream and your vision so burning like a deep desire that don't let that thought get in you can be bummed but say no i'm doing this because i gotta provide or i'm traveling here because i gotta provide like i was just in you know scott still at the soup we are one of our companies that my wife and i own sponsors the uh, c- cigar party with all the celebrities and the the NFL guys and then the celebrity golf tournament. That's the annual um, Super Bowl yeah. celebrity golf tournament. And so I'm down there and like, you know, my daughter, we, I, you know, I'm, I've been divorced. So I only have her so, so much. And it's usually Thursday and Friday and then every Thursday to Monday. Um, so I had her, I had to miss Thursday and Friday to go down there, but every, we all are so aligned and even my ex-wife's aligned that, Hey, I, I have to go do my thing and, and, you know, do what I got to do. I don't, I don't get to choose when the Super Bowl is or when this, when the yeah. golf tournament is or anything like that. So I feel like, you know, it's good for her to see. And then she's always calling me like, Hey, are you working? Yeah. You know why I'm working to provide, you know, we, we go through it and we talk mm-hmm. about it. So she knows that, Hey, I'm not leaving you. Yeah. I'm leaving, you know, I have to, I have to go do what I do for the family. Cause yeah. that's what I felt back when I was little is I felt like my mom and dad were leaving me. Yeah. And I had to, it took a long time for me to realize that, no, they're not leaving me. They're just, they're they're I'm their dream and their vision to provide the life. So I'm kind of the reason they're leaving. Yes. But it's, it's a, it's a good reason. Not like, Hey, they don't like me. Yeah. So and I, I think, think there's extremes with everything. Yeah. It, all of that too. I, it, everybody has a different situation and a different sweet spot in what they're capable of. Right. And I think so much is understanding what's the perception you hold and then the paradigm or lens that your partner or your family or your kid or your business partners hold. And being able to communicate that right. clearly and really, really understand like, what are they seeing that I need to over communicate or come to? Obviously, as you're building tons of companies, like I'm doing teams and, and doing different things and dude, communication, you got to be an expert at this. If you're building something the way that you're at, I already see the bottlenecks of what are we not communicating effectively? How are we, how are we getting to the bottom line, this information? And you see the impacts it has on your culture, on your relationships, on expectations and frameworks. So, as you've kind of like 
started building all this, obviously you saw the way your parents ran and you just kind of made a comment, which is funny, right? Like they had us and then 18 years came back. You've obviously had some things right. you loved that helped. And I think all of us do. And then there's stuff you're always trying to move the needle forward on. As you've started building this life, what are some of the things you've noticed like inside your family and in your business, those communication things that keep things healthy and keep things moving the way you want them to? That communication is important. It's everything. It's the foundation of how you build a good relationship. Good. It's trust, right? Like it goes down to the, to the, the trust factor of thing, or, you know, a value, like one of our values of our company is trust. And, you know, I keep it with everything. And one of the values of our, our, my family is trust and communication keeps that trust. You know, we're all on the same page. And I feel like people, like communication is tough. And like I, but people are not going to marriage counseling or relationship counseling for too good of communication, right? Like it's, yeah. it's a foundation of most of the counselors that you talk to that like, Oh, we're helping communicate. Like I'm not going to counseling saying, Oh, I know what my wife wants to eat. I know where she wants to go to eat. I know the exact time of movie. Like I know everything about her. Like I know, no, it's like, you know, we, like you're always kind of button heads, you know, because it's, it's communication. Right. And I feel like the better you communicate, like me to a fault, I'm almost an oversharer, but I want everybody to know what we're doing and be aligned. And I will ask a million questions. So I know what's going on. So there's not like this guessing or assumption. I hate assuming things because I feel like I'm always wrong. So I'm like, Hey, you know, just to make sure this is, you know, what, you, how you see it, or, you know, I'll, I'll do a lot of follow-up emails like, Hey, I know per our conversation, you know, we just talked about this is, this is what I'm understanding. Correct. You yeah, know, yes, correct. Because I'm trying to open up those communications and it's so much easier when you can communicate and you're on the same page, right? You're and every, the point of communication. I feel like is to get an alignment in, I meet with teams. I meet with people. You know, I do a lot of uh, executive coaching and team coaching and different things and personalities and man management styles. And a lot of it has to have come there. It comes down to how you communicate to each other, especially down to the personality styles of each individual. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because some people like to be communicated to, you know, to as a certain way, and then they communicate in a certain way. And you know, in in you, if you're not like that, you almost resent and you think that they're trying to, you know, a certain you know, yeah. beat around the bush and like, you're trying to just be like, Hey, just tell me what's going on. And I feel like in, in business and in life and in your relationships and marriage, like everything, I feel like the more, like it, it's the more indirect you are is almost doing it a disservice rather than just being more direct. Now there is a very good and not good way of how you are direct with somebody. Um, but you know, knowing that and knowing your personality style and their personality style and knowing how the synergy of the team is working, how you're direct with people and how you have those conversations with people, good and bad is very important because they have to happen. And as a business owner, you have to have those very direct conversations with people, but knowing that the point is like, Hey, just, we're going to get an alignment, you know, at the end of this conversation, let's get an alignment. It's not to beat you up. And so yeah. same with, you know, relationships. Like I talked to my wife all the time, like, Hey. You know, the point of this is to be on the same page. I'm confused. I feel like we're not, you know, playing from the same playbook right now. And we're going to keep in score in two different ways. So let's keep the score the same way. Let's play from the same playbook. And then let's figure this out together. And that's like, okay, then you take a little, what I call a reset. You make sure you're all on the same page and then you kind of can move forward. Yeah. I, dude, I love that. And I obviously building my, my career starting out in sales and building sales teams. I know you've done a lot of, obviously you guys are doing crazy tons of sales. I'm sure you're talking to your sales teams and you're meeting with yep. sales manager and leadership all the time. I feel like that is such a huge difference between like a level people that can transition from the sale to sales leadership. And I know you've, you've talked about this before. A, a lot of times like high performing salesmen don't turn into high, like high level sales leadership or high level owners. And, and right. at least in my opinion, I don't know, I'd love to hear from your side. One of those vast differences is the ability to go and communicate. They might be able to be direct with a prospect and pull out their objection and their real concern and do that. But taking that skill to a coworker or to a team and then having empathy, having like love and genuine authentic care for, for somebody right. else's performance or a spouse, right? Like is a lot trickier. Right. So for you, I, like, how have you seen people develop that? How have you developed that? Because I think that skill is kind of like that income accelerator, at least in my opinion, to be able to create transactions, be able to create human capital scaling in alignment with other people right. is like the only way to go really right. big. 
Well, it's ultimate goal is duplication, right? And then you're not like, you're not, you know, you're building a system-based business, which if you, you know, anybody listens to, I talk about a system-based business versus a superstar-based business all the time and finding someone that can, you know, a really, really good salesperson or really, really good individual, you know, it's really good at their task or good at whatever they need to do. isn't necessarily the best manager because manager and a laborer are two different things. I think that it's a big misconception of, oh, they're the best. So I'm going to keep promoting them to be the best. And you see that. Well, sometimes, especially in our industry, yeah, um, a lot of the management, like in our industry, sometimes makes less than salespeople because it's a different commission plan. It's a different scale plan. You know, it is, you know, there's just a different aspect to it, but there's more, you know, to being a manager and in leadership than in helping train and helping, in, you know, like have empathy and, you know, do what you got to do and being a true leader, like mm -hmm. a true leader is completely different than even a manager. And a manager is completely different than a laborer. And so you have like tearing up this scale. And so we have like management and training programs. We have leadership and training programs um, to be certain managers and general managers and different things in our company. You have to go through different classes and learn different things and like all sorts of stuff. It's really, really cool. And a lot of it has to do with self-development because we totally believe um, if you build a better person, you build a better company. Yeah. Um, but seeing those people, like a lot of dealerships, it's funny, a lot of dealerships you know, started at least in the RV business are really good salespeople or sales manager who went and started a dealership. And they did horrible at 95% of the stuff besides selling. Well, selling is only one aspect to a dealership. It's There's a lot more that goes into it. And you know, they're, they got one track mind kind of, but a true manager and a true leader has, you know, they see it from a 30,000 foot view and they know the strengths and weaknesses of a team and they can figure out how to play. And it's almost like a chess game to them to figure out how to mold everybody together to get them operating smoothly at a higher level and training people. Like, you know, we have salespeople or, or, you know, service people a lot that want to be a service manager. And it's like, okay, well, you know, what, why do you think you can be a service manager? Oh, well, I can do this really good or I'm the best technician. Okay. That doesn't really have anything to do with being a manager. Yeah. And so then you sit down with them and say, okay, this is what a manager is going to take. And then even the service manager is going to be a service director. It's okay. Well, why do you think you can be a service director? Well, I'm the best service manager. Okay. Well, have you trained anybody to take your spot? No. So why would I think that you could train anybody else? Hmm. Oh, okay. So now, okay. Train someone to take your job. And as soon as they take your job, then you can go to the director. But the only reason that you're not with us at corporate is because you haven't trained anybody to take your job. And that's our environment and our company is I'm like, hey, the only reason you can't go on vacation and limited is because you haven't trained someone good enough to take your job. Like yeah. when I see someone that trained someone so good that they took their job or doing better than them, that person to me is invaluable because I'm like, hey, they did. They were so good at training. Replicate. And like you said, that human capital, then replicating and duplicating, I can put them somewhere else. I can now make them a regional or a director or whatever they whatever the position is going to be to train more managers. Like that's invaluable to me because that's true duplication. It's how we're going to scale the company, but I'm not going to overscale the company if our, if our talent or our human capital isn't there. And so we have, you know, a ton of these conversations with people and a lot of it has to do with self-development, but I always tell people, look, just because you're the next, you're the best technician does not mean that you're going to be the best manager or even be in the running for manager. Like it has nothing to do with that. So don't think that the way that I keep score as a service manager is the same way I keep score as a technician. It's two different scoreboards. I, I like that so much. And I think, especially in sales, that's such a lost concept, right? Like we, we look at right. sales, but no one ever thinks of it. Like for sports, for example, how often is the apex predator player come back after NBA, NFL, MLB, and then just comes in and is like the best coach in the league forever? Like, you don't see it. You don't yeah. see it very often. And it's it's different principles like the mics, right? Like you hear, I'm sure you've watched that that series and his team yep. talk like, dude, he, he brought the best out of us, but we all hated him. We were scared of him. Right. And he he doesn't run teams anymore. He's on the ownership side. He brings the it factor from like the apex guy you want in your team, but not necessarily like running your team. It, right. And, and those are distinctions. Obviously, is is your building this. When you guys are talking about building this out, I, I'm intrigued because obviously I'm in the business of scaling people and scaling teams on both sides of the, the field that I play in. What are you seeing is like the most effective thing that you're looking for and has the most impact on actually getting people to become that guy? So dude comes, hey, yeah. I'm the best at this, but he hasn't replaced himself. How do you then understand if he is capable of learning to develop those skills? But give them a challenge. Look, these are the things that you have to do. It's kind of a trial. Okay. You have to, 
I need you to do X. You have six months to do it. It's a tryout. And if you fail, I'm like, it's up to you. I'm going to give you every opportunity to, to have, to have the opportunity to succeed. Yeah. It's totally up to you. It's not Jason. It's not anybody. Now, if you need help, raise your hand. Mm-hmm. If you need support, raise your hand. That does not mean that you're incapable of doing your job, but you need to show us one. You need to raise your hand. So I always tell people, Hey, it's the, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. It's the person that raises their hand the most and says, I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy that has kind of, you know, quote unquote, I'm sorry to say this, like the balls enough to come into me and say, Hey, I want to be your next service manager. Yeah. I look at you and I'm like, okay, if you, if you want to come to me and tell me what you're going to do, talk is cheap, buddy. You got to, you we got to do some things. So here's the 10 steps or with the five, whatever you got to do. And here we got to go have a, you know, a conversation with this person, a conversation with that person and get you on the track. And so they kind of, they have to show. And I got never want to pigeonhole anybody with personalities or different situations, but they need to show me that they want it first off, because some quite often we want more out of people or want more from people or want more for something than they want for themselves. And every single person isn't going to be that apex. Every single high performer in sales isn't going to necessarily want to be a manager or a GM or a leader in any way. A lot of them just want to come to work do their job and go home at five or six or seven, whenever their shifts off and just forget about life and just, you know, just go chill. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. You know, quite often in leadership positions that doesn't, it never ends, right. It's never, you never have really any time off. And so they have to show us. And then it's, it's, it's how they're doing and how they're operating and the questions they're asking and how they're dealing with people. And it really comes down to how they deal with people and how well they are you know, working with their team. I don't care if you have all the talent in the world and you can't deal with people. You're not really a good fit for my leadership team. Yeah. Because being a true leader is not a dictator. It's not a, you know, I call it the seagull mentality, which I don't know if I can swear on the show, but you fly in, you shit on everything and you fly back out. Like I have some managers that are like some, I've had some directors in my, my previous, you know, work, work history where they're directors, they'd fly in, they'd shit on all of us and they'd fly back out. And then when they flew back out, we're like, um, what do we do? We're more confused. They don't like, do they like us? Do they not like us? I don't want that. I want true leadership when they come in. I want true leadership because we're traveling to locations. We've got them all across the country. So we're doing different things. And I want true leadership and true management, you know, styles and, and how they can coach people. Like I want a true coach, like yeah. not a person who is a theory, not a person who says they can do something, a true coach. Like you just said, isn't necessarily the biggest talent. Like we see it with Jason kids doing okay. I'll give him some stuff, but like Steve Nash doing okay. Like, there's these people that we view in our brain. Oh my gosh, they they would be the world's best coach, but it's like they're not even like who is like I, some yeah. of these bench warmers um, are some of the best coaches. But then you think about it, and I'm like, wow, like I you learn so much being on the bench because you're hearing the coach coach all the time, right? So that's what you're used to seeing and how he operates and coaching, and you see it from a different perspective because you're maybe not so worried about the 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 details of the game, if that makes sense. I rode the bench a lot in high school and I am not afraid to say it. I broke both my legs two times. Um, So for two years, I pretty much didn't walk. So I just chilled there, but I learned so much about coaching from my basketball coach that I actually coached when I was in, um, when I was a senior, I coached our ninth grade team. Ninth grade was in my, was a high school. And I'm like, I don't even know how I'm just repeating my coach. Like I'm just, I'm figuring this out because I listened to it so much. And so that's kind of my perspective from it that I feel like a lot of these these talented people are used to seeing a true leader operate that isn't so focused in the game and the details. They're more of how it operates as a whole and they become some of the greatest coaches we have. Like someone like like Steve Kerr. Yeah. He's a good player. I'll give him that. He's a good player, but he wasn't no Michael Jordan or LeBron James. Like he was just a point guard of the it's, team that won all the championships. No offense. The love oh, dude's amazing. But like does he not do what he's doing with the Warriors? Do are any of us using his name ever? Right, like none of us are talking right. about Steve Kerr if he isn't building the dynasty that the Warriors are from a coaching standpoint. Right, right, hundred percent agree. But it's a different skill set, dude. There's a ton of stuff you just said that I, I kind of want to dive into because as I've gotten older, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, dude. Teams in high school to companies you started working for to the companies that you're running and seeing what makes the difference and I think that element that you're talking about, those unbelievable coaches are a part of every just kick-ass program, whether that's a league team, a high school team, a college team, a great company. And it, it's funny because even the guys that I know, it's like maybe not even necessarily like the most skilled in basketball, football, or in that specific business sector, but people who can unlock great vibes, great confidence, 
great stories, great instillment, and get people to do what they do best, I feel just create unbelievable winning environments. And obviously, For sure. you're disrupting an RV space. I don't know if you grew up studying RVs necessarily, but like, nope. <laughs> would you nope. say your yeah. superpower going into that is just building amazing cultures and teams? Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, but previous life, I built a huge team, you know, thousands of people in the network in a network marketing company. And so I kind of learned in it from a very you know early age. I watched my mom and dad build a team around a million people in their network marketing company and, you know, sold out the Georgia dome of 97,000 people in a business meeting for three days in a row and create massive like movements. Right. And so I feel like that's been my biggest strength is finding the best in people and really believing in people and, and, and being like present with people. And when people are talking to me, whether it's any, I don't care who it is. Like I go into the dealerships and the, you know, some of the detail department talks to me, the forklift drivers, the, you know, whoever is talking to me, I'm a thousand percent president or present, you know, with them. I think that's very important, but getting the best out of people. When, when I've had some coaches growing up where it was all about them, all about screaming, ripping you apart, no self-confidence. Like there's a way that you tear someone down and, and then you build them back up. Totally. I've had some coaches that just tore us down and they're like, hey, I expect this, you know, 15 year old kid to build himself back up. It's like, bro, like I'm, I'm a. I don't even know what life is right now. And then you start playing for yourself on those teams. You know, I don't care about the coach. I don't really even like, you know, care about my teammates because maybe this person likes the coach and I don't like the coach. So I don't like this person, but I've had coaches that will, will, will put character in you. I'll say that. And then, you know, maybe break you down, but build you up and then teach you and really teach and coach you the game and the mental part of the game. And so, you know, I look at that like in business of like, Hey, how can I, have constructing criticism or like actually tell this person like, Hey, what you're doing is wrong, but have a game plan to help him get better. Because that's my number one job as a CEO owner of a company is to set my guys up for success or girls or whoever, my team up for success. That's my number one job. And so if I go into that or every situation is how can I set them up for success and be a true coach to them and true teaching in whatever I can do to support them and build them up and give them the self-confidence, not micromanage and, and let them have autonomy. If they're a, you know, my president or a COO or whatever in my company, I'm like, Hey, go do your thing. Don't bug me about the little, you know, little details of stuff. I trust you. And having that trust is super important in the company. That's how you scale. Cause if it's a superstar business based business, just based on me, well, I'm only me and I only have so many hours in a day before I go crazy. Right. But if I keep duplicating those efforts and it's, even if it's a slower game to me where it's a long, longer run and a longer game to me. So even if it's a slow beginning and we're working on some stuff, but we're laying that foundation of those principles and foundation in the location or whatever, where, hey, we're not going to go come change everything in their life super fast. We're going to set the foundation and let it, and then she's going to roll and pay us forever. I'm more interested in that. Oh. I don't want to go, you know, I always joke with people, hey, when we go buy a location, I don't have a bus sitting out there with a bunch of people. So we're buying you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't go anywhere. Like where I'm not, like I don't, I don't have just, especially we're in some rural areas in Missouri. I'm like, I don't know anybody here. You're the only people I know. So I'm, this is not our plan is to come change everything, but we'll make some adjustments as needed and do our thing. I, I like that. Something you said, just, it, you know, not a superstar, like just built on superstars, but superstar systems. It, it kind of just made me think, obviously we just watched the Super Bowl. I'm in Kansas City, right. a huge Kansas City fan. I think probably one of Heck the best yeah. examples of this, I'm sure you saw this growing up, like, dude, the way that Andy Reid gives a leash to Mahomes has enabled him to be the player that he is. Like if you take away the ability to throw cross field, do everything that a quarterback for the entirety of the existence of the position has been told not to do, throw on the run, throw across the field, throw underhand, throw from a different position, throw with your offhand. Like he does everything he's, that every quarterback has been told not to, but a coach who says, dude, you do that really, really well. And you play really well that way. I'm just going to let you do it. And if you mess up here and there, like that's okay, but it's, it's creating this unbelievable performance for us. It, it seems it's kind of what you're saying, being able to find the best in people, especially in that business sense. And, and it gets really hard. I know I've, got into this where you almost bottleneck people because sometimes it's the temptation of like dude you're not doing it the way that i would do it but that doesn't necessarily matter right and, and just right no 100 percent yeah. agree yeah and you got to think of the ultimate goal right it's just the win so right andy yep. andy reed just wants to win a super bowl he, how do you win a super bowl i don't i couldn't tell you how many the completion percentages i couldn't tell you i mean i think the score was like 35 to 30 i don't even know yeah. like 30 yeah 35 30 like i 
that doesn't matter. We know that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. And so when they get to the locker room, it's not going to be like, hey, like I saw that you threw that ball this way. I know that we scored a touchdown, but I probably wouldn't do that. I mean, there's some situations where your quarterback might go in and he shouldn't be going in head first and needs to slide. And it's like, bro, like you need to chill. But you don't yell at him. You don't scream at him and call him, you know, names, whatever. It's like, hey, like, you know, for the betterment of our, it's not good for you to get hurt. Yeah. Next time slide. Yeah. Hey, I got you. I got you. I got you. But hey, thank you for sacrificing your body. Thank you for giving everything you had. I know that you wanted to do it just to make the play. And so it's letting people do their, you know, I have a, a buddy of mine. It's one of my partners calls it a superpower. Let people focus on their superpower mm-hmm. and don't let them focus on anything. You know, try to teach them stuff that, that's not, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, outside. And it's like, I have a buddy who has a big uh, mortgage company and he's like, he interviews his people or maybe if they're having some struggles, it's like, what do you love? What do you hate? I love X. I hate Y. I hate all these things. Okay. Then don't do anything you hate. Do everything you love and do it 110%. Because I'd rather have 110% on you, these, these three things that you love, than 50% of you on these 10 things you hate. Yeah. And so we'll figure it out. Like we'll, we'll get some backup. We'll try to figure out what we can do. And, you know, sometimes there are some things that you're going to have to get a little bit com- uncomfortable with and it just comes with it. But it's, it's that communication like we talked about before of how you communicate that. It's okay. I, you're going to actually have to learn how to talk to people or learn the computer system or learn this or learn that. So how can I help you? How can I support you? And in the meantime, I'll take care of it or this person will take care of it or whatever. We're going to support you on your way, on your journey of learning. And it's just not losing focus of why you're here in the first place of winning. Like I tell you, look, I'm just here to win and I don't care how we get there. I don't care if my inventory director or HR director is sitting on a beach in Tahiti. If we're winning, we're winning. Like be available or whatever. Like if you if that's what you want to do, then cool. Like just let's just win. Like I'm not going to worry about the little details of stuff. Dude, and, and that's an interesting thing too, because right, you're dude, you're 28, 20 or 29, sorry, and you've been right. a, a crazy success. And I know that there's people who are going to listen to this, and I've even had it, and I'm I'm not at that level, dude. So, done some cool stuff, but I have people even in my life. They're like, well, when are you going to stop? You know, when when does it go? And I've had this conversation so many times. I think it's such a funny question because I think that there's that there's a misconception and i think a lot of people right i'm sure you got into the space at least in some way shape or form motivated financially for some things you wanted lifestyles you wanted but i mean at this point i feel that it's more about the winning knowing who you are and what you're capable of that people miss and understand that these super high levels of wealth i don't know anybody who's like i just so bad want to be a billionaire or 100 millionaire like or worth 10 they're just like Dude, I want to leave a legacy. I want to know that I'm the best in my space. I want to dominate. Do you feel like right. is that driving you now? Or is there still like, you know, these goals of a jet or something? And maybe that is ancillary goals, but I, I think that'd be interesting for people to understand. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, my goal is just I just want to be good. First off, the best husband I can be, the best father I can be, and the best, best person I can be. And I'm really focused. So I mean, I grew up in in money, yeah. luckily, that I really don't care about it. It, it was never a thing in my family, never talked about. Never glorified worship, nothing. It wasn't like money, 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 money. Like I saw, I'm like, I really don't care about money. And like we do have our own airplane. Um, I have too many of them. I'm actually trying to get rid of a couple of them. But um, so I'm like, okay, cool. We got our plane. But like, really my heart was like, hey, I, I can't wait to take employees and like family, like on the planes. And like, yeah. mold, you know, I've taken them to the Rose Bowl a couple of times on the planes. I brought two of our planes down to the Pac-12 championship with my whole family and a couple of friends. Like just like that's my love language is I want to give people experiences and see the smiles on their face. And that like, that's my motivation now. And and yeah, and share, like, I'm like, look, we, I, you're, if anybody close to me always like knows that I say, Hey, everybody's got to eat. And I want the biggest table I can possibly have. And it's not going to be for everybody, but if you want to say, Hey, I want to eat at your table, let's just make it the biggest for all of us. And so like, that's my motivation is to help as many people as I possibly can. It's not really for me because I don't really like, that's not really my driving factor now. Yeah. Like, I've heard, you know, money's right, right up there with oxygen and I'd rather have more of it than less of it and blah, blah, blah. And you can do some really cool things with, with money and all these things like that. But it's really the, the byproduct of the money is what I'm really focused on. I'm, I want to create a life for my family that they, they've always wanted. I want to create a cool experience. Like what boss called, has a phone call and says, Hey, I'm going to Oregon tomorrow. Come with me. Let's hop on the jet and let's fly up there go to Oregon for an entire day and we'll be back before dinner and you, you'll, you'll be good. Like that's the experiences I want to give to our employees. And that's a big motivating factor for me because it's all about those, you know, those experiences with them. So yeah, I mean that I want to leave a legacy. Our, our whole um, MO with our company is we don't want to be the biggest. We want to be the best. We just want to be the best. 
everything we do, we want to be the best. We want to be the gold standard in the RV industry. We want my vision. My vision statement is I want to be the number one company people want to work for first off, buy from second, and the vendors want to work with. I want to be the guy that's walking down the aisle at the conference and you're like, oh man, it's Jason. Can't wait to see him instead of, you know, dodging him. I want to be, lead that legacy and, and impact people's life that I care about. Oh, Jason made this much money or Jason has that. Or, like, I don't, I might wear a different watch or, you know, have a nice ring or a plane or this or that. I want to be the same Jason when my foot steps on that tarmac, walking out to the car with my whatever. I want to be the same Jason as I was 10 years ago. And I feel like because I saw that with my mom and dad, that they've never changed, that you wouldn't even know that they had any money. I feel like that's just the norm. I've never had like a a family member or anything that's like all about themselves or like all about my stuff. Like I have an uncle that collects some gnarly cars, which I can't even say some of the cars that he has in, <laughs> on this because I'd get in trouble. Um, but some of, you know, one of multiple one of ones of the world that I have never even been filmed. And he, he doesn't ever tell anybody or show anybody. And he's just chilling by himself. So like, I just have really good examples in my life. And I just want to be like them. Dude, I think yeah. that's, that's so powerful too, because it, it is unfortunate, right? And I, I think I've had so many conversations where there's a limiting belief that achieving certain levels of something is going to take you out of that phase, that you can't be successful. You can't have abundance. It's at somebody else's detriment, but you're obviously to your product of a family who was grounded, had the right things shared with people. You're building another leg of perpetuating that mentality. You have other people in your circle that are there for people that are moving up, right? Cause not everybody's going to be a CEO or build, but I think we've talked a lot from the coach's perspective. I love to hear a little bit. Obviously you have a ton of employees that are building up inside. The right. company. What is the ideal player? Somebody that is coming into the space that's building their career. And they're obviously working for you, working for somebody else from being, you know, these coaches having those mentalities, how can people move up and progress themselves? Like what do they need to be working on? What do they need to be consuming to stay grounded. Is it just the right conversations, the right circle? Yeah, I mean, ask the right questions, you know, and and get get kind of a mentor, um, whether that's someone in our company, and just learn all you can. Don't act like, like – don't spend all your time trying to act like you have the right answer. Spend all the time trying to find the right answer no matter where that comes from. And when people want to excel in our company or step up, it's like, hey, you know, I want you to – work. like I said before, is build a better person, you build a better company. Now we got to start some self-development stuff. You know, I'm making people read books or making people go to leadership conferences and making people just really understand how to be and really because I can teach skills. That's, that's the easiest thing. Well, I can teach skills. But what I can't teach is how who you are and as a person or the, what I call like intangibles, right? Like I can't really I can't really rewire your brain. Now I can coach you and help you. And a lot of people like we have a culture statement and culture cards, like literally a card in every single per one of our um, cool. like wallets that. and our employees that we're all here for the same reason. It's got our mission statement on one side, our values on the other. We're all here for the same reason. I have had people get weeded out because they didn't love that. I'm like, cool, gone. See ya. Some big high performers because they're like, hey, like this doesn't really align with me. Cool. Well, I'm only looking for people that kind of align with us as a company. Like it's just weird to me because I feel like, oh, why would you want to be a part of a company that like that like why you know that doesn't care about the people like i feel like people would want to be a part of a company that don't feel like a number but i know pretty much every single person who works for us like that are i try um but like who's really in tuned with their with their employees like that's the try the culture that i'm creating and you know when a person's trying to raise up you know and go up and it, it's it's do the extra you know extras it's go the extra mile it's help in ways that you you know in, in ways it might not have to do with your job. It's asking questions. It's trying to get access to the person, the CEO, the owner of, and try to get, you know, use them as a mentor. Like people that, like I said, are raising their hand are the ones that I'm going to call on and say, Hey, like, let's, let's have a conversation. It's the people that, you know, are like, oh, I'm good. Like, I don't really talk to me. It's okay. Well, maybe they don't, you know, I'm just going to assume that they don't want to go up or they don't want to be promoted or anything. It's the people that are raised in their hand are going to get called upon. So I, that's what I always tell like our whole team is raise your hand, read the books, ask questions, get involved. Like just if you want to do that, now I'm not going to make anybody want to do that. They have to want it for themselves. Cause I've got caught so many times, like I said before, as just wanting other people to succeed more than they want to succeed themselves. Whether, whatever that is like success is so many different de definitions, but 
And that's not, there's like almost nothing more draining than that. Cause you get so emotionally invested and passionately invested in some of you. Like, Dude, I want this so bad for you. And I can see that you could, but you, you can't like light a fire for somebody. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, someone's got to have their own dream and their own vision for their own life. And, you know, I'm coaching this one, uh, this one company right now where they have one of the best, um, it's a very like, uh, specific job in the world and he's a technician doing it and it's a very it's you know a handful of people in the country are really really good at this and he asked them to be one of them and you know they wanted to be a manager and they keep calling him a manager and he you know i was teaching a class and he kept saying well why do i have want to care about culture why want i want to care about this i just want to go do my job and i want the company to succeed because i'm so good at my job and you know i'm like okay well we have you know cool we you know we can figure that out but i talked to his his managers or his bosses the owners of the company i'm like i think that you guys want him to be something that he doesn't want to be have you ever had the conversation with him of what he wants to be and they're like well no we just assume that he's a good manager and can train all these people I'm like well have you had that conversation with them and they end up having a conversation with them and he's like i just want to be really good at what i want to do and i want to teach other people the skill set of what i want to do but i don't want to be a manager Went, wow. So you guys are trying to force management down his throat and he doesn't want to do that. He wants to be a trainer and that's how he wants to add value to your company. It's like my, a watch. Like every part in this watch has to work in a beautiful way to tell the time, right? So in a company of all kinds of different positions to be able to win and same team, it's not a, it's not 11 quarterbacks, it's not 11 Patrick Mahomes. I mean, he, we probably do a good job if we had 11 Patrick Mahomes, but it's not 11 quarterbacks on the field playing the game. It's, it's a whole entire you know, 53 man roster of different positions and different people, you know, even in different plays, you know, you got the nickel back, you got dime back, you got all these different things and how you even pull up a defense. I mean, they're so, it's so complicated and that's how you can kind of view a team. And so I was talking to these guys, I'm like, make him a trainer. Like that's his superpower. He wants to teach like that's his passion. And so I went and talked to him about doing that. And he was like, yeah, he's like, he lit up. And I'm, he's like doing paperwork and worrying about managing people and worrying about their feelings. And this doesn't really make me excited. And I'm like, then why, like, what do you love? What do you hate? And he's like, I love, tr I love doing my job and I love training people. Okay, cool. Well, this is a very hard position because like, there's a handful of you guys in the country. And so we're going to have to cultivate our own. So who's the next person we're going to start training? And we picked one and now they're going to start this training program with them. I'm like, that's going to help you guys scale because they can't overscale this position, right? Because that's the person that does their job. And so it's kind of funny that I'm like, I'm like, it's just ask people what they want to do and what, you know, it's, a, it's easy. It goes down to what do you love? What do you hate? Yeah. Like it's so easy. And don't, don't try to force someone to be something they're not because they're going to get burned out. They might say yes, because they don't want to disappoint you. And they're going to end up getting burned out and then leave. And then you're going to wonder why did this person leave? What happened? Then you're going to, you know, all these thoughts and stuff when it's just, you made this person hate their job essentially. Dude, it, it actually makes me think of, I just read a book by the Harbinger Institute. It's called uh, Outside of the Box Leadership. I don't know if you've ever read it. It's, it's great. but Dude, I think that someone just sent me that book. Dude, you got to read it. It's Outside amazing. Of the box leader. It, I think someone just sent me that book. Super quick read. It's really, really good. But basically, same thing you're talking about. Just so many times we we like slam this tunnel of how our companies operated, how our teams operated, you know, promotions, training, management, roles, whatever. And we view it. But how do you put yourself outside the box and how do you recognize when am I in it and do I need to create a new thing for this person? Like, like your story, right? This dude doesn't want right. to be a manager, but he could be a lights out trainer. That'll light him up. That'll fulfill him. But we need somebody else to play this role. We're looking at this. just yeah. wrong. We're looking at this through one window, through one lens, and we can't keep slamming this peg into the wrong size hole. Um, right. But it's. It's crazy as I've, I've been, just as you're saying, I'm thinking about my own organizations and different things. I'm like, dude, how many people am I, it, maybe not even in a macro sense, but in micro senses, shoving them into to routes that they don't want to be a part of, that they don't want to fulfill, and that maybe they, it, it's just not, it's not going to light them up. So it's a detriment to all of right. them. I'll lose an energy trying to get them to go there. Right. And it's, it's like pushing a wet noodle, man. It just doesn't really make sense because people are stubborn. Like you can't make me do something that I don't want to do. Now, I have to learn to be uncomfortable sometimes, but if I really don't want to do it, I'm just going to say, no, I don't want to do it. That's why I've surrounded myself with the team. And essentially, like when you're dealing with that with people, it's like, hey, like how can we – this person is really good at closing, but we have him out there as a salesperson. We have him out there, this or that. Like how can we support him in a way that he's just firing on his superpower? Yeah. And it's, 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 sad. it's sad to see sometimes when like that relationship or that, you know, that communication gets broke – it breaks down and it ends up not being good for anybody. 
And, but it just takes those conversations and those open conversations about like, what do you want to do? What do you like to do? What, what, what do you love? What do you hate? What's, what are your, and then like, I, I make everybody do personality tests, which I, you know, me, me and a couple of the guys developed the software really them. And I kind of, you know, piggybacked on a little bit of this, but um, you know, a software where they take a personality test, it's a 30 page report. And then a management test of how they manage people and view people. That's a 30 page report. And then we start coaching on their manager styles and personality styles. And we're like, man, we, we got this person in a completely wrong position. Now I will never, I will say like, I'm never going to pigeonhole people. Like if your management style is a certain way and you're in a position that needs to be another way. Now we can coach and train, right? If your personality necessarily isn't the personality for this position, we can coach and train. But it takes a person to have what we call like performance, um, you know, check-ins, which is like, hey, a quick like 10-minute check-in. And we have a performance management software that everybody's a part of that reminds us to do all these. It's checking up on them. And if they keep failing, keep failing, but they, you know, and how to coach them in certain ways to succeed. And at the end of the day, if they're just not succeeding, you need to have that conversation. I'm like, hey, like what? Do you hate this? Do you love this? Like, do you do you get so excited about doing what you're doing every single day that when your alarm goes off, you pop out of bed, your feet hit the ground, you can't wait to come to work and do what you're doing now? And if the answer is no, because I'm miserable, because I can't figure this out or that, we need to have that conversation. I don't want you to be sitting there, you know, at 8:30 brushing your teeth, saying, "I'm I can I do not want to go to work." I want you showing up early, having a good time, super excited, bringing the energy. You know, we call it a nonverbal where if you come in like you're pissed off and that just screws everything up. But like coming in happy, like driving around, like like how can I get the best out of you? Because if I was to put you in a certain situation, let's say, let's say Top Golf, for instance, if I was to grab five of your friends and invite you to Top Golf, how would that interaction be? Hey, what's up? Dapping each other up, having a good time. Whatever. Now, how do I do that at work? How, I, I'm, you, you're going to want to come to this situation. How can I recreate that at work? It's going to make you so happy that you can't wait to go and that your smile, your smiles on. And so we coach and we train through that and we manage through that. But a lot of it has to do with our culture and we manage through our culture, which is super unique. Um, you know, I haven't really seen many people do it like how we do it or really anybody, you know, do it how we do it. I'm managing through the culture and knowing that about your team and caring. Like you said before, you have to have empathy for people mm -hmm. because everybody is the circumstances of a million different situations that have happened to them up until this point in their life. And they've had a lot of things, a lot of trauma happens, a lot of, you know, the way they've had other jobs have happened. And so you have, it's, it's your job to get the best out of people and to, and to extract that from them where they, and then instill the belief and the vision that they can be anything they want. And then we can scale this puppy. And then, then you'll see like massive growth in your organizations where everybody is firing on all cylinders and there's clarity. We have a great vision and we're, we're, the belief is so deep in us that we know we can't fail. So it's like almost like a childlike blind faith where they're just going to keep rolling because they know we can't fail because they trust everybody on their right and on their left. I love that, dude. I love that. Um, well, just as we, we close up, man, I want to respect your time, but tons and tons of good stuff. For anybody who's listening, I think couple takeaways i'm, I'm kind of just like noting if you're running an organization or a team a lot of inventory to be done after you listen to this episode um and then as well i think if you're working somewhere and you're in a position i think this is probably just as critical too and you're in a place where that isn't available that maybe it's it's time to find a place that has the right opportunity for you in the right vehicle because i don't know about you but i definitely am a believer if you're in the wrong vehicle with the wrong people and the wrong team like you can be, you can be the A player and, and have the right capabilities or you, but like you could get bottlenecked just because the people around you aren't going to give you what you need. Right. Yeah. And, it, and it's so important for you to do something that you love to do that is aligned with who you are as a person, your values, your non-negotiables that, that gets you excited every single day to pop your feet on the ground, wake up and pop up and just have that, that excitement. Now, am I going to say that's a hundred percent of the time? No, you know, life is stressful and things happen, but it's up to you to set yourself up for success where you're aligned and you understand what's going on and you, you, you match the morals and in, in, in who you are as a person to who you work for in the company. I think that's very important. I feel, I, I'm sad for people that are in situations they feel like they can't leave or they hate their job or hate this or hate that. You know, one, I would say big piece of advice is, is tell them, you know, like, Hey, I don't like how you treat me. I don't like how this happens. I don't like how that happens. In our company, we have multiple times we get feedback surveys that are, how's Jason 
like it, literally on me. Like I feedback survey myself with all the employees. I get tore up sometimes. That's hey, awesome. you say this on your podcast and you didn't come here and you didn't do that. Or you said you would do this and you didn't. Or, and it's anonymous. So they, 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 it's a, Hey, I but it. I don't know what I don't know. I, I don't know what I don't know. So I, I, and a lot of people don't want to sell it to me to my face. And so I give them opportunities to do it in an easier way. But I challenge people, look, I can't help you if you do not tell me what the problem is. If I go to you and you say, how, and I say, how, how is everything? And you say, great, 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 great. I'm just going to assume that it's great. So I would challenge you if you're in one of those positions like you just talked about, raise your hand and say, hey, I have a problem. Now, if how they react to that says a lot about who they are as a company. Hmm. I like that. Well, dude, just just in closing, I think this is always something I want to extract from everybody, especially who's running businesses, um, a little more just technical, your personal finance views. I think so many people uh, are listening to this and, and everybody has this lens like, oh, I'm not a business owner. But the reality is everybody owns the business of their home. They got revenues, expenses, liabilities. They got their own balance sheet, right? When you're running a big company, I just feel like most people who've ran a company, you might not be the finance leg or whatever, but you have – usually a better understanding of the way your cash flows are working yet you, you've had to start looking at money more technically and develop thesis and, and principles that you live with your family on what you spend and why you spend if you could just your quickest you know two to three minute nuggets on the way that you guys and your family operate the way you you know you you manage or look at the way you guys run the money in your home yeah, I mean, we 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 live very modestly. Um, my employees will come to my house and kind of laugh sometimes in my house. Like I, my podcast um, studio is down in the basement of my house at the moment because we're building a headquarters and I took it down there. And um, you know, I had some very high level, very wealthy people come to my house. Like this is how you live. Like you have a jet. I'm like, yeah, man, my jet costs about 15 times as much as my house, but I really don't. Like that's not like one of my huge like one of my personal values is not like my home because I lived in a massive house growing up it made me hate massive houses so hmm. I kind of feel like I got lucky cuz that's not really my my goal now we are building a home and I want it to be a good home and entertainment home for my friends and family again me think kind of thinking about everybody else but we live very modestly you know we put a lot of money away out of a money manager that does everything for me between real estate and different things I also invest a lot in real estate and I have a lot of real estate um, but I, you know, I grew up in a family that if you don't have cash for it, you don't pay for it. I have zero debt besides my house. Cause that was back then. I think there's really like 2% or two and a half percent, whatever that was. So I'm like, yeah, sure, bro. I'll, we'll do that. Um, now the interest rate's going up a little bit, but, uh, um, you know, super modesty. If I, if I can't pay cash for a car, I don't, we don't, we don't buy the car And you know, we, we, one of our values is we, you know, we put money away for experiences and we, we know wherever, whenever any dollar comes in, we know the money is going out and we don't really buy a lot of things. We just, we want to go do fun things with our family and experiences and vacations and Disneyland with the girls and different things like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a guy that's, you know, now investment debt is different than personal debt. Totally. Um, you know, I'm not a guy that wants to go leverage himself to death and be house broke and car broke and buy every Lambo and Ferrari in the world, which, you know, I, I probably could. Um, but that's just not super interesting to me. Now I'm a big car nut. I will, I do have a, you know, C8 Corvette, but that's a, a different story of me. I, me and my dad bought them together. Um, kind of a more of a dream thing since I was younger to, to do that. But I I think that people get in this dangerous cycle of trying to figure or trying to be like somebody they're not, hmm. and they feel like that Strap wearing a nice watch or driving, yeah, because it's like oh I'm getting around wealthy people, um, you know I got to wear a watch, I got to drive a certain car, or different that, and they get over leveraged, and if that's starting to happen to you, it's a dangerous cycle, especially when the markets go up and down. If your your overhead is what kills companies. Um, you know, it's not necessarily your variable costs because those go up and down as the markets come. But if your overhead, what we call fixed costs yeah. are super high, then when the markets come down, those costs don't go down. Like it's just, that's just there. Right. And, you know, same in your home, like if the markets are going up and down, but you're spending so much money on a house or so much money on cars or stupid stuff or this or that, like it's, it's a vicious cycle. And so we just try to keep disciplined and you know we do have a lot of nice things but we live off a very like a few percent of our income most of it goes to other investments and you know i have different retirement i mean i even have stuff for you know set up for retirement i have stuff set up for my dollars college stuff um through a financial planner of just putting my money places that obviously is going to make more 
more money than a bank account. So being smart with that, but it's, it's, it's difficult because when you start making a lot of money, it's hard not to go spend it. It's hard not to go buy that car. It's hard not to go buy that watch or go on that vacation or, I mean, go buy nice seats at a basketball game or go this or go to that, which I'm all for rewarding yourself. Like that's one thing that I, I think is important is I'm all for rewarding yourself and seeing the fruits of your labor, but don't over leverage yourself. Like don't beat, put yourself in a stupid position by John trying to be something you're not, but reward yourself. Like I've set goals, you know, and if I hit something, I'd buy a watch. And so I bought a watch. And if I hit, you know, a car or this or that, like that's how I've got most of the stuff that I have. And, you know, the plane was a, you know, thing for the company and taxes and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to reward yourself. So it's a fine line. You got to reward yourself, but then don't do it stupidly. Yeah. I, a couple of takeaways, I think for, for anyone listening to I, I, dude, you're, you're building a lot of things. I think it's really easy for people as they start having a little bit of success or increasing their income. They're like, oh man, I can handle this. I can handle this. I can handle this. But you're even saying, Hey, you know, I have a money manager. I've got real estate partners. I've got people that that's their game. You're the RV guy. You run the RV right. business. It's like, dude, bring in experts in your field to set up your kids' college funds. Understand what's coming in, what's right. coming out, in play. Like, dude, I, I love, like, I set a goal. If I hit the goal, then I can have the nice thing to reward myself. I think that's so fun. Like, that's part of the, that's part of the chase, right? But there, there's a right. huge difference in maxing out the incremental income into your personal liability category of your home and your car is where people get waxed. Right. And right. doing fun stuff and having experiences and then recognizing, hey, what's going on today might not take place forever. Like, you, right. you, don't, you don't know what you don't know. And so just being aware of what's right. coming to the plane. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with all that. I mean, it's so important to, 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 to be who you are. Don't, you know, if you are, and it's hard because I've seen a lot of my friends, especially in the, you know, no offense, the door to door game is make a lot of money in door to door. Boom, one summer crush it, and all of a sudden, boom, they're buying. Rolexes and diamond watches and diamond Florida chains and Mercedes and like flex money gas yeah. lit industry in the world. <laughs> now I do understand that you do have to show people that you're recruiting that you can have a living and create a life, but you don't need to fake that. You don't need to be someone that you're not. You don't need to over leverage because trust me, it's more important to them that in 36 to 48 months, you're still there with the same lifestyle. than it was a flash in the pan in six to nine months in one summer. So I, I feel like that gets lost in a lot. Like in the network marketing world, it was crazy, especially with these companies giving free cars and stuff. They'd go buy the, hit this rank. Yeah, get this car payment. And then they never hit that rank again. And then the company would stop paying for their car payment. And then they're stuck by the car payment. I know a, I know a handful of people that actually end up working for the dealership to work off their leases and work off their pay. Like it's crazy. And so I just want to, you know, would caution people to get someone. Like I have a guy that I can't spend more than $10,000 without calling him and telling him, Hey, I need, I need this money. He's like, Nope. But I'm like, you know, if I want to go buy a, that, more than $10,000 cool watch. Yeah. He's like, Hey, no, you have it in this, that money. Okay. What's the opportunity loss or cost? That's yeah. $10,000 here by the end of the year. That'll be this much money or that much money or whatever. No, I'm not letting you do it. Like that, this is not what you told me you wanted. Like now if it's on your vision board, like I'll give him a list of my vision, the, you know, Hey, these are my goals. Different. Totally. But it's like you just rent because I had a problem. I just randomly eliminates invest in stupid things. Lights out decisions, especially with investments, right? Like because I have a ton of people that hit me up for investments all the time, and it eliminates that emotional side where I'll give him all the documents to look at it and say, "Yes, this is a smart investment. Mm. This is what I think." Because he's a pro. I mean, he manages billions of dollars, yeah, and so he's like, "Yeah, that turns and yeah. yeah." And so he's like, "Hey, that that's outside of your wheelhouse, dude. Don't do anything like that." Like, no. I'm like, okay. Now text him. Hey, man, my, my money manager said, no, I'm sorry. And it helps me because I, you know, have all these friends that want me to do stuff, but I'm like, Hey, I just blame him. It's easy. Dude, that that's all. If nothing else, that is a huge freaking takeaway for people in a personal finance level. Like get you your a player that you can default to that runs your stuff. My living, yeah. here's my visions. Here's my, here's my stuff. Here's my goals. Don't let me freaking do this. That's awesome. Yeah. And like make that. sure that they're, make sure they are a player. Cause there's a lot of fakes out there. Yeah. A lot of fakes out there. So yeah, it's, he's my guy. He's, he's saved me a lot of money. Cause I've, yeah, I mean, he saved me a lot of money, made me a lot of money, but saved me a lot of money. Dude. I love it. Well, brother, I am super appreciative of you hopping on, sharing a ton of stuff. I, I've got a lot of stuff I got to go through and I got to do some inventory. So it, it, I love getting to, to pick people's brains, but 
for everybody who's listening, where can people follow you? Obviously, we got the Culture Camp Pod. Definitely can get more and more of these conversations that you're having with unbelievable guests all the time on culture and systems and processes. But where's the best place to kind of keep tabs on you? So my uh, my Instagram is pretty much the best place. It's just Jason Haugen. Um, last name is H A U G E N. And, you know, I answer pretty much all my DMs there. I try to answer all my DMs. Um, I do have a culture camp Instagram. I'm really never on it. I'm really trying to build my my personal one. But then you can find my podcast anywhere on any podcasting platform out there. And, yeah, I mean, my my whole mission right now is culture and building the culture and being the, the culture kind of coach in, in a lot of these industries. And it's been it's been a blast. So um, hit me up if you have any questions. You, I mean, anybody can hit me up if they have any questions. I'm happy to help. This is my mission. This is what I love to do. And so just, dude, thank you for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. Dude, we appreciate you, man. For everybody listening, take some notes, run this back, do some inventory. We'll catch you next time on The Money Game. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. Real money. Real money. Money is the answer. Y'all be cool. And we'll see you next time on The Money Game. Money. Money. Yes!